Hi everyone, it's Grace. Welcome back to my channel. In the last video, I talked about loan to value ratio status in each state in US market from as low as 60% all the way to 100%. Just by looking at the map itself, we can tell that the LTV levels are the lowest they have been. In fact, much lower than those in 2008. I think the LTV ratio is an important indicator to tell people how much debt there is in a current mortgage market. Now we can have a clear idea of how many properties can withhold what percentage of price crash and prevention from going underwater. But does property value not being underwater necessarily mean that the housing market will not crash? Will people still dump the properties or they just decide that they don't want to keep making the mortgage payment anymore even if the market values are not underwater or the properties are not being foreclosed? I think these are all the possibilities. Historical data is definitely an important comparison, but I think it's important not to fit every scenario into a box because anything can happen in a real market. The trigger of a crash can be anything. Right now in China, a lot of people are dumping properties, not because the property values are underwater, but because there is no liquidity in the market. So I do think the post COVID era is special in many ways. And that's what I try to analyze in each video and find out the trigger and risk factor of a crash. Before we begin today's video, remember to subscribe to my channel and click on the bell button so you'll get notified immediately when new videos are uploaded. Also, feel free to give this video a thumbs up if you find it useful. In today's video, we're going to cover another crucial indicator of the housing market, and that is the foreclosure rate. I gathered 20 years of data from the first quarter of 2002 to the third quarter of 2022, including foreclosure, bankruptcies, and deed in lieu from FHFA to first understand what percentage of properties are in foreclosure right now. And second, look at the market volatility pattern of each state. While I was preparing for today's video, I decided to add the Fed funds rate into the chart because I'm like, you know what, the mortgage rate is so reactive to the Fed rate hike right now, and it's easier to include it so we understand the pattern of foreclosure. So in a map, the figure label is the foreclosure rate in third quarter of 2021 for each state, and that's the latest data. The blue line is the effective Fed funds rate, and the red bar is the foreclosure rate. Just by glancing through the red bars, you can tell that the foreclosure rates for almost all states are the lowest for the past 20 years, with part of the Southeast and Midwest above 1%, while the rest of the states are under 1% foreclosure rate. And South Carolina and Georgia are the only two states above 2%. One crucial difference between how the foreclosure rate reacts to the Fed funds rate and how the housing price reacts to the Fed funds rate is that the peak and bottom point of the foreclosure rate is one cycle delayed after the Fed funds rate, meaning that the peak of the Fed funds rate is the bottom of the foreclosure rate and the bottom of the Fed funds rate is the peak of the foreclosure rate. There's definitely some pattern differences among the states and we'll get to that part later. But the housing price trend synchronizes with the Fed funds rate, so the peak and bottom of the Fed funds rate and the housing price trend align with each other. I'm not saying that we're exactly like 2008 because clearly there are a lot of differences. But using that as the closest reference, and I'll be using Nevada as an example, where we're at right now, we're probably close to being around, say, the second quarter of 2004, where the foreclosure rate was also very low at 2.4%, and the Fed funds rate just started hiking at 1%. From the second quarter of 2004 to the third quarter of 2006, the Fed funds rate reached a peak at 5.24%, and the foreclosure rate actually dropped a little from 2.4% to 0.9%. And then from the third quarter of 2006 to the third quarter of 2007, the Fed funds rate kept around 5.25%, basically at the same level. But the foreclosure rate spiked from 0.9% to 3.1%. So one risk factor is that the Fed funds rate reached a peak and kept at a horizontal level for a period. I think a lot of people don't realize this subtle factor because this is one of the immediate risk factors that you'll see something really odd the next day. And then afterwards, the rate decreased from 5.26% in the third quarter of 2007 all the way down to 0.15% in the first quarter of 2009 without a break. During the same period, the foreclosure rate skyrocketed from 3.1% to 12.4% and the foreclosure kept climbing up to 16.4% in the fourth quarter of 2010, while the Fed funds rate stayed at the bottom. 
So we're looking at a period from the second quarter of 2004 to the fourth quarter of 2010, which is about six years. So you should know that recession is not like the snap of a finger and then boom, the housing crashes. It doesn't work like that. The housing market changes according to the schedule of the Fed funds rate, and it really happens over an extended period of time. And I think right now the Fed is trying to spread it out and it's not impossible to extend beyond six years. So for those of you who are seeking the absolute bottom point to purchase, I don't know, you could be waiting for six years for the real estate market to bottom out. And I don't know if you can call it a strategy at all because opportunities are usually in the short run. I mean, yeah, on the one hand, you can definitely wait around for six years, but on the other hand, you can also take action according to the Fed funds rate schedule. I'll add a bonus at the end of the video to summarize the key periods of the Fed funds rate schedule so you'll have a much better financial plan. So remember to watch to the end of the video for the bonus tip. So now let's take a look at the other states that have a similar pattern as Nevada. And the eye immediately goes to Florida where the current foreclosure rate is at 0.7%, but back in the second quarter of 2004, the foreclosure rate was at 2.4%, at 1% in the third quarter of 2006, 2.7% in the third quarter of 2007, 11.9% in the first quarter of 2009, and 14.7% in the second quarter of 2010. The other markets that are very similar to Nevada and Florida, but less volatile, include Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado, on the west coast and the rocky mountains there are also a couple of states in the midwest like minnesota illinois wisconsin and michigan one interesting thing you'll notice is that these states are more reactive to the 2008 financial crisis than the 2000 dot-com crash because there is also a peak around the third quarter of 2003 and now let's take a look at the states that are more reactive to the 2008 than the 2000 recession, but have a double peak after 2008. These states are mostly in the Northeast. For example, in Connecticut, the first foreclosure peak happened in the first quarter of 2010 at 4%, and the second peak happened around the second quarter of 2013 at 3.6%. So if we're using the foreclosure rate as an indicator of the peak of the housing crash, there are two housing crashes. The first one happened six years after 2004 in 2010, and the second one happened nine years later in 2013, which is quite unusual. Some states even have three peaks. So the other states that have post-2000 double and triple peak include New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, DC, Hawaii, and Alaska. I mean, it's pretty interesting to see that. So if you're from any of the states, do you remember what happened in each of the foreclosure peaks? And then there are the states that are more reactive to the 2000 dot-com crash than the 2008 financial crisis, which is very interesting. So I'll point out these unique foreclosure patterns so you'll have a much better understanding of the housing market movement in each state. For example, in South Carolina, the foreclosure rate in the first quarter of 2003 is 7% and 5.3% in the fourth quarter of 2011. The other states that are similar to South Carolina include Kentucky, West Virginia, Although West Virginia doesn't have much volatility at all after 2008. Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama. There are a couple of states whose foreclosure peaks are basically the same in a 2000 dot-com crash and a 2008 financial crisis. In Texas, the foreclosure rate in first quarter of 2003 is at 3.4%, and in the fourth quarter of 2010 is at 3.3%. And the other states similar to Texas is Indiana, Ohio, Missouri, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. And the states that have the least volatility to the Fed funds rate include Vermont, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, only a peak in a dot-com crash in South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Kansas. So as you can see, the foreclosure rates are the lowest in almost all the states. 
But will there be a housing crash without a foreclosure wave? That depends on the Fed does. If the Fed does something dramatic tomorrow, the liquidity will be pumped out of the market and the US housing market will act like China, where liquidity itself crashes the market and not foreclosure. But if the Fed continues the Fed funds rate schedule cautiously, we will see the foreclosure pattern spread out over several years and a foreclosure wave will be the trigger for a crash. And here's the bonus tip for you to find out the foreclosure rate pattern and the Fed funds rate schedule. In the first stage, the Fed funds rate starts from the bottom to the top, and low foreclosure rate reaches to bottom low. In the second stage, the Fed funds rate flattens out at the top, and the foreclosure rate starts spiking. In the third stage, the Fed funds rate decreases to the bottom, and the foreclosure rate skyrockets. In the fourth stage, the Fed funds rate remains at the bottom, and the foreclosure rate stays at the top, and then it slowly decreases. These four stages represent the stages of a recession, and right now we are at the very beginning of stage one. So, I hope you enjoyed today's questions, answers, data analysis, and a bonus tip. In the next video, we're going to take a closer look at the mortgage rate. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.